In this video tutorial, we'll go over some sample calculations from our last lesson on salt hydrolysis and buffer solutions. So what I'd like you to do is press pause, try this question out yourself. When you're ready, press play, and we'll take it up together. Alright, so the question states that 25 grams of potassium fluoride is added to 450 milliliters of water. What is the pH of the solution? It then goes on to say, you may assume negligible volume change. Meaning, when you place 25 grams of the potassium fluoride into the water, so you sprinkle that powder in the water, the water level should not change significantly. So the solution volume remains 450 milliliters. The question then goes on to tell us the disassociation constant for the HF hydrofluoric acid is 6.6 .6 times 10 to the power negative 4. That will be useful for us uh, later on. Now, if you asked a grade 11 student, is KF, potassium fluoride, acidic or basic, they would say neither. You don't see any hydrogen atoms, you don't see any hydroxide ions, so how can it be acidic or basic? Well, that would be due to salt hydrolysis. Looking at our reference sheet for KSB values for fluorides, I don't see potassium fluoride on my list. Because potassium fluoride is not on my list, I can assume that it is 100% soluble. This list only deals with compounds that are insoluble. So when solid potassium fluoride is dissolved in water, 100% of it will dissociate into potassium ions and fluorine ions. These ions then have the ability to react with water in a single displacement reaction. So the cation potassium will react with, or rather displace the cation hydrogen, pushing it out so you have hydrogen ions flowing around and the potassium hydroxide. However, we know that potassium hydroxide is a group 1 hydroxide, meaning it is a strong base. And by definition, strong bases will completely dissociate and completely break up. So if KOH completely breaks up, this can't exist. Therefore, this reaction does not occur, and sodium, or rather potassium, is considered to be a spectator ion because it doesn't actually participate in the reaction. Looking at fluorine, however, its anion will push out the hydroxide anion, so hydroxide will be left out, and you form HF. Now, HF, hydrofluoric acid, is a weak acid, meaning it is able to stick together in its molecular form. Very little of it actually breaks up. So if very little of it breaks up, you're going to have a lot of hydroxide ions floating around solution, and that in turn makes my solution basic. Alright, so the first thing I'm going to do is to find out what is the concentration of potassium and fluorine ions floating around my solution so I can undergo salt hydrolysis. So I said 25 grams of uh, potassium fluoride, the molar mass of KF is 58.09 grams per mole. That gives me 0 0.43036 moles of potassium fluoride. Since the final solution volume remains 0 0.450 liters, concentration is moles divided by volume, you now have the molar concentration of your potassium fluoride. Now the ratio of potassium fluoride to fluorine is a 1 to 1 ratio. So for every 1 potassium fluoride, 1 fluorine anion is released. Well, if you have this many KFs concentration, then that is the same concentration as the fluorine. Notice how I don't care about the potassium, because the potassium is my spectator ion. It will have no effect upon pH. Only the fluorine will affect the pH of my solution. Alright, so the fluorine concentration is 0.9563 moles per liter. Moving up, let's take a look at the fluorine and see how it uh, interacts with the water. So we have fluorine in an ice chart, 0.9563 moles per liter. It's going to react with water. I don't care about the concentration of water because water is a pure liquid, has no effect on KSB. And it's going to be zero and zero because the HF hasn't had a chance to react, or I'm sorry, the fluorine hasn't had a chance to react with the water yet, so there's no HF being produced and no hydroxide ions released yet. The reaction must go forward, it can't go in reverse because there's nothing on this side, so I'm going to have a minus x plus x plus x, it's all 1 to 1 to 1 to 1 ratio. So at equilibrium I should have 0.9563 minus x for fluorine, x for hydrofluoric acid, and x for hydroxide. Now if you look back at the original question, it gives me the Ka value for hydrofluoric acid, so how well hydrofluoric acid will dissociate, how well will it break up, 6.6 .6 times 10 to the power negative 4. So going back over here, You'll notice I've got my hydrofluoric acid, but it's not the one that's changing my pH. It's the fluorine that's causing the water to change the pH. Now, if you recall my acronym, big ale, base is gain, acid is loss. But gain and loss of what? Protons. So if you look at the fluorine over here, the fluorine is going to gain a proton from the water to turn into HF. So because it's gaining, the fluorine is actually a base. So I can't use the Ka value they gave me at the uh, start of the question, at least not directly yet, and that is a common mistake students will make. So what I need to do 
is I need to convert the Ka value for HF into a Kb value for its conjugate base, its base partner instead. So I'm going to use the equation Ka times Kb equals Kw, which can then be rearranged into Kb is equal to Kw divided by Ka. I'm not sure why the K was offset there. Uh, but 1 times 10 to the power negative 14 is the Kw value divided by 6.6 .6 10 to the power negative 4, which was your Ka value for HF. And now I have the Kb value for the conjugate base fluorine. All right. So how well it will ionize there, which is 1.515 times 10 to the power negative 11. From there, I can write down my Kb expression. Kb is equal to x squared divided by 0.9563 minus x. So if you look back over here to my ice chart, products over reactants, x squared, x squared, 0.9563 minus x, 0.9563 minus x. Now to simplify things, I'm going to use the assumption rule. You don't have to, you can definitely use you don't have to, you can definitely use the quadratic equation to solve for this, but it certainly simplifies things a lot. So what I did was I took a look at the uh, x value over here, took the initial concentration divided by my kb value, and I found that the uh, value was greater than or equal to 1000, so that means my x value is negligible. From there, I can just take this and uh, get rid of the x if it's negligible, so it becomes x squared divided by 0.9563. Solve for x, and you get 3.806 times 10 to the power of negative 6, and of course x is the concentration of my hydroxide ion. So now I have the hydroxide ion concentration. From there, it's just a matter of using my pOH calculation. pOH is equal to the negative logarithm of the hydroxide concentration, which I plugged in here. So therefore, my pOH value is 5.419. But the question asks for pH, not pOH. So I'm going to use the conversion factor, where pH plus pOH adds up to 14, rearrange the equation, and solve for pH now that I have the pOH value over here instead, and therefore my final pH is 8.58. All right, so by adding in a salt and having the salt react with water through salt hydrolysis, I have caused the water to release hydroxide ions, allowing me to affect my pH, which is now basic, 8.58. All right, let's try a buffer calculation now. Again, press pause. Try the question out yourself. When you're ready, press play and we'll work it out together. All right, so the question asks, what mass of sodium acetate, so the solid powder, sodium acetate, NaCH3COO, should you add to 650 milliliters of a 0.335 mole per liter solution of acetic acid? Because we're trying to make a buffer solution with a pH of 4.60. Again, like the previous example, you may assume negligible volume change, meaning that when I dump this powder into this uh, acetic acid, the volume of 650 mL should not change significantly. We can assume this is the final volume. It then goes on to say that the Ka value, or the dissociation constant for the acetic acid, is 1.8 times 10 to the power negative 5, and that tells us how well the acetic acid will break up and release its H plus ions. All right, so here's the game plan. I've got some 0.335 molar acetic acid, and then I've got some sodium acetate, and the question is, how much a sodium acetate can I dump into the solution so that my final pH is going to be 4.60? So looking at sodium acetate, I don't see it anywhere on my KSP chart, so I can assume that it dissolves 100%, releasing sodium ions and acetate ions. Now, I don't have to worry about the sodium ion, because the sodium ion, if it undergoes salt hydrolysis, will release H plus and NaOH. But I know that NaOH is a strong base, so there's no way this can stay together, therefore this H plus does not exist and it has no effect on my pH. So no reaction here, and my sodium is a spectator ion. The acetate ion, however, will affect my pH because it will interfere with the acetic acid's ability to break up releasing H plus ions due to the common ion effect. All right, so the first thing I'm going to do is find out what a pH of 4.60 would look like in terms of the hydronium concentration at equilibrium. So if you recall, the H plus concentration is 10 to the power of negative pH. Since the pH is 4.60, 10 to the power of negative 4.60 is 2.51 10 to the power of negative 5. So I can plug that in here to my ice chart. Molar concentration of H plus ions is 2.51 times 10 to the power of negative 5. Since I know the initial concentration of H plus was 0, and the final concentration of H plus is 2.51 10 to the power of negative 5, then I know the change in concentration was 2.51 10 to the power of negative 5. Since this is a 1, to 1 to 1 molar ratio, then therefore these values over here are positive and negative 2.51 10 to the power of negative 5. 
I can then write out the equilibrium expression where Ka equals to the ionized divided by the unionized component, or if you will, products over reactants. So there's my acetate ion, H plus ion over acetic acid. My final values at equilibrium are X plus this number, 2.51 to the power negative 5. The actual value, 2.51 to the power negative 5 for the concentration of H plus. And at the bottom, 0.335 minus the 2.51 to the power negative 5. Solve for X, and you get a value of 0 0.2401 moles per liter for X. So now I know the concentration of my acetate ion. I can use that information to find out what mass of sodium acetate did I need in order to achieve that concentration. So looking over here, oops, I think this is it. Uh, the ratio of sodium acetate to acetate is 1 to 1. So I know what the concentration of sodium acetate needs to be, 0.2401 moles per liter. Since the volume didn't change, negligible volume change, the volume is 0 0.650 liters. Mole is equal to C times V. I have the concentration, C. I have the volume, 0 0.650 liters. Just be careful, make sure that... Uh, you have the 0 0.650 liters because it is a liter solution, not milliliters. And you'll get 0.156 moles of sodium acetate required. From there, mass is equal to moles times molar mass. There's my moles, 0.156 moles. The molar mass of sodium acetate is 82.04 grams per mole. We can find this from the periodic table. Multiply the two, and we need to have 12.8 grams of sodium acetate dissolved in the solution in order to achieve a buffer solution value pH of 4.6 in the end. Alrighty, so this is a sample calculation on buffer solutions. If you have any questions, let me know.